Piotowski. Today on Fresh Outlook, we begin in Ferguson, Missouri for the second week in a row. The eyes of the world are watching this town of 21,000. From the international cities of Milan to Budapest, the shooting death of 18-year-old Michael Brown is the top news with headlines that read race riots in America. Is this an accurate portrayal of the United States? Let's have a look and talk it out. Attorney General Eric Holder discussed his recent visit to Ferguson, the site of racially charged riots after the police shooting of an unarmed African-American teen. We had, I think, constructive discussions about the importance of maintaining peace, averting future acts of violence or vandalism, and ensuring public safety. Missouri Governor Jay Nixon ordered the State National Guard to begin withdrawing from Ferguson after earlier ordering an emergency virtually putting Ferguson residents under house arrest. Every road coming into this area has been blocked off. It's not right. You shouldn't do people like that. We being held in captivity like animals. About 100 people gathered last night, walking in laps near the spot where Michael Brown was shot. And local police say the event will change how they conduct their business. The people need to be in front of them telling us how we can connect with them. As protests largely died down, some residents complain about the lack of jobs and racial segregation. There is such poverty right now. There is such favoritism. There is such still racism. Ferguson, formerly a mostly white community, has lost more than 40 percent of its white population. By 2012, poor black residents in the suburbs had a staggering poverty rate at 53 percent. Well, thankfully, after nearly two weeks of protests and riots, there was a more tranquil environment in the city. But what about places like Staten Island, New York? Today, thousands are protesting there. Shops have closed and many residents there are praying for peace. Uh, joining us now is my co-host and former White House aide, Dee Dee Benke, Dr. Donald Tibbs from Drexel University, and Joseph Blaitler, criminal justice expert from East Coast Private Investigations. We welcome you all and thank you so much for joining thank us here on, on Fresh Outlook. A pretty, pretty amazing to see something like these riots that we've seen uh, for the last two weeks. Um, just want to talk about just your, your personal feelings, uh, James, because you're just uh, joining us here. Just when you saw this uh, unfolding for the last two weeks, what were your thoughts? Uh, I don't, initially, I don't know what my thoughts were because it just seemed all of a sudden it just flashed up. Um, it seems they, the officials really didn't have control in the beginning and it just became a flashpoint and it just snowballed from there. I mean, to see, we were talking, Donald, uh, Dr. Tibbs, uh, before about how these headlines um, overseas, I had friends in Budapest, my family sent me uh, the you know, newspapers, I was looking at uh, the Italian newspapers, race riots in America. I yeah. mean, that's like something from, from uh, decades ago. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's a very bad situation in, in Ferguson. And, and I think that what's happening is that the news, obviously, the news media is trying to figure out ways to cover this. And they have to talk about race. They have to talk about rioting. Of course, they could use rebellion. They could use some, some word that's quite not as inflammatory as a riot. But it certainly is trying to draw in the attention of the, of the public to give them an opportunity to sort of weigh in on it in some particular way. And we do want to talk about the media coverage, whether or not uh, the media has been irresponsible or responsible in their coverage. Um, but Didi, uh, we're seeing a little bit more of a tranquil environment in the city, which is certainly great news. But the city, as I said, is 21,000 people, not entirely reflective of the U.S. No, I, it, it's a small place. I mean, it makes it, makes it look like it's Detroit or mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. And I think the media absolutely is feeding into this, making it worse. And you have the people there, they're getting on TV, they're like, well, hey, I'm getting my attention and it just seems like they're making it much worse than it should be fueling the fire so yeah I, you know I, I think that that if the media would be a little more responsible it would be helpful yeah. well we talk about media but we also have to talk about social media of course mm -hmm. because that's a, been a game changer as well oh, yeah. um, in cases like this um, James you work in criminal justice how is this uh, how does this help and hurt the police when when covering cases like this well the issue you have with the social media is you don't know what's accurate and what's not accurate Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of misinformation going out there that's not always accurate. Um, people communicate a lot more quicker now, so you can assemble quickly. So it creates issues for the police. But again, I don't think it's a bad thing, social media. 
but you just have to be careful because a lot of stuff on social media is not accurate, not correct. Mm -hmm. But that could have been very well what, why this blew up, like because you've right. had a lot of these type of cases. Mm -hmm. But I kind of think it is social media. I think that's why this blew up so quickly, like a flash mob. Right. And they knew they were there were some people angry and just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and all of a sudden, look what we have. Well, I was really actually particularly struck that the police chief was tweeting <laughs> as he there was arriving go. at the scene, yes. like we just got here. Oh my God, dead body. Oh, what are we gonna do now? We're gonna do this. And I so was it's very like, shocked. You're getting those tweets coming in from the police chief while they should be doing an investigation. And that made everybody go down. crazy. Crazy, Yeah, absolutely. I think it, like a flash absolutely. mob. Well, let's talk about uh, the investigation and let's uh, specifically talk about the autopsy. Uh, this young man is, uh, was shot six times. Can this be justified? It depends. It's really going to depend when all the facts come out. I mean, uh, we still haven't got the ballistics back yet. Um, was he sh shot at close range? Was he shot from a distance? We don't know that. There's some speculation that that shot went off inside the police car. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, reports came out that he was running away from the scene and was shot in the back. So really, at this point, I don't think a lot of the facts have come out. So we don't know if this was reasonable or it wasn't reasonable. Right. And of course, uh, we also have a grand jury, as we know. Um, there were are nine people, uh, nine uh, white people and three African Americans. Mm -hmm. It's a sitting grand jury, as we were talking about, mm -hmm. Dr. Tibbs. Do you think that's going to be uh, in better for the case or worse? And we also talked about the prosecutor. Yeah, so I don't think that the grand jury is much of an issue as is the prosecutor at this particular point in time. It seems to be that there is a great concern about the prosecutor in this case because of his very close family ties to the police. I believe that his father was shot and killed by an African-American man and he refused to file charges against two African -American, young African-American men who were shot by white police officers several years ago. and his. I believe it's his mother, brother, son, and cousin all work for the police force. And he said that he couldn't be a police officer, so the next best thing to do was to be a prosecutor. Those words, those family ties, they're, very, they're lingering there. And so when you have a grand jury, the prosecutor plays the judge, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the judge, and the jury, and he presents the facts to, to this particularly closed inquiry. So we don't know what he's going to say. And if we believe that there's bias in, in him in any particular way, then you can present the facts in a way that doesn't make it seem like the, the, the police officer actually violated the law. So do, we all, the do we all agree that he should probably be eliminated then or excuse himself? I'm really up in the air on that one. Because I think he should recuse. I think he should too because there are other good prosecutors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, really, why not? Why not take that off the table? Yeah. You could take it off the table. Um, I'm kind of up in the air because I believe all prosecutors tend to lean towards the police mm -hmm. and, and you know, changing prosecutors. Leaning's one thing, but diving in over yeah. is another. And that's just, it's just because there have been so many riots and problems. I mean, why instigate? Right. I, I agree at that, at that point, but I don't think he's the cause of the riots and But there could be more. If there it, could be more if down the road. The decision but at this point right now, I don't think he, the prosecutor himself is the cause of the civil unrest. So I but think, there could be more because of him. Though. So I think, I think long range looking at this particular thing, if he presents this, if he doesn't recuse himself and he presents this case to the grand jury and the grand jury refuses to indict, there's going to be more riots. That's, 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 that's going to fall exactly back on the prosecutor. I, I if he recused himself and did everything that's in line with what the public would like to see happen, because there's already great mistrust for the police anyway, and another prosecutor presents the case and there's no, um, and the grand jury comes back without an indictment, we probably won't have the same type of outcry from the public. That would be my biggest concern. I, I, I agree to a point, but I also believe if a new prosecutor steps in and there's no indictment, we're still going to have some issues. And yeah. some you know, it's probably true. We might have a return back to where we were a couple of days ago. So I, I think from that point of view, if there's no indictment, I think we're going to see some civil unrest again. Then I think we all agree there needs to be an indictment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, now, Joseph, um, I called you James before. I apologize for that. I don't know why I did That's that. Fine. Um, but Joseph, I do want to uh, talk about some of the other um, evidence in this case that, uh, the, that, the, uh, pl uh, that the police will be looking at specifically. Right. Well, they're going to look at the ballistics, obviously. The ballistics are going to tell a lot. Is there gunpowder residue on, on Michael Brown? Um, you know, was he shot at close range? The shell casings, where are the shell casings? That's going to be able to determine the distance of where the officer fired from. The injuries the officer allegedly sustained. Mm -hmm. um, those are all going to be factors. And I, I think right now we, we haven't heard the facts. Yeah. I mean, we have not heard the facts. Uh, what were your thoughts about the video that was shown? I think they shouldn't have shown the video. Um, I don't know who made the decision to release it. Because the police, it. The, the police were told not to show that. Right. Yeah. 
and and uh, they they decided to do so, which I think also was a mistake on the, on the local police department. It was definitely not, not a to, mistake. Not to point fingers because it, it mm -hmm. inflamed the situation. Yeah, it inflamed the situation. And again, I know there was some talk about. Um, Michael Brown's friend that day, why wasn't he arrested? Mm -hmm. I actually think that's a good idea the police didn't arrest him because that would have just inflamed the situation more. Yeah. I mean, if, he, if there was a robbery and he was involved, you know, you have well, time to I'm deal with that later on. I'm going to ask another question because you, you said where was his friend. Um, I'm going to ask a different question. Where is President Obama? Uh, do you I think golfing. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And, and, I, yeah, that, uh, and he, in golfing at a time when, especially in an issue like this, I mean, that would be good for him to show leadership. Well, now, I think he handled it better than the Trayvon Martin case. But... Uh, still, I think, you know, it's just absent at, a, at the wrong time. Yeah. Dr. Tibbs, I mean, do you think that, I mean, he should have shown some sort of presence there? I mean, they did keep showing, uh, certain news outlets did keep showing him out golfing. Um, but it was two weeks. It was, a, it was an extended period yeah. of time. I think, I think the, the, the escalation probably happened so quickly and so rapidly that it's, it, it may have been difficult to adjust the schedule like that I can't really speak to, but I do think that at least sending in Eric Holder and the FBI was the right move to make, particularly on the president's part. And I think that that's his call, and I think that's the right thing for him to do at that moment. I don't think that you would find any president of the United States that would go and run into a riot scene just for safety and dangerous reasons. But I also don't want to indict him just because he's African American and he's supposed to be there because we've been trying to move away from talking about race and trying to be more pro post-racial. So we don't want to sort of turn to him and say, well, because you're black, why aren't you there with the citizens of Ferguson? It's a great point. Um, I also want to talk about the, the police force, 93% white uh -huh. and you do have a, a city that is yes. the majority is african-american African -American. um does that do we need to see more equality across um law enforcement in in cities like this i think they tried though i mean yeah. I, I think they really have tried to recruit but it just hasn't happened yeah. i mean what do you do I th and I think that that's what Eric Holder has been pushing for, sort of, a, a, I think the language was a more robust um, diversity in terms of police departments. I don't think that predominantly white um, police forces in African American communities is a new invent. Uh, I, I, it happens all over the country. And so you, you, it, it's an issue there, and it's not really an issue of white presence in black communities. It is how do these white police officers treat, treat the African-American citizens? That's the thing that's most important. And in, citizen, in cities like Ferguson, if there is no real community policing, then when you have these breakdowns, it just exacerbates and brings out all the other problems that have been there long before. And that's uh, certainly something that's been brought up over and over again. Um, as I've told uh, both both you right. gentlemen, mm -hmm. um, I worked in downtown Newark. I worked in Newburgh. I covered a case very similar to this in yeah. Newburgh, New York, mm -hmm. only two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't see the rioting. We didn't see it in Jersey City, New Jersey, not too far from here. However, we did see it in Cincinnati about 10 years ago. Yeah. But right. why are some cities, and again, it goes back to did the media inflame the situation what made ferguson uh go onto the international map yeah the I way think it social did. media is a big part so, of it social media i think also the way the story has been leaked out too i mean we haven't gotten all the facts right. and, and i think we are still waiting on those but one of the biggest facts that's out there that i think concerns most citizens and i think inflaming the people in ferguson more than anything else is that the storyline is that michael brown put his hands up and surrendered and he was shot and so that is if that's a if that's a fact that really comes out then we've got a much bigger crisis than a race issue a black and white issue we've got trigger happy police officers who aren't following the law and that fact needs to come out but there are also reports that there was a struggle in a car he's a big guy clearly he was in a bad mood we saw in the store right, that right. he was in a struggle and he, he's at you know we are almost gonna, 300 pounds we are going to continue our discussions sure. uh, uh, on this case uh, we're going to take a short break though when we come back we will be talking more about ferguson missouri and also an american journalist is beheaded in a chilling message to president obama the brutal murder is horrific but so is the response on social media why are so many people clicking to view the loss of an innocent life and what does it say about society